Okay, we're back inside theCUBE. Uh, we're here with SiliconAngle.tv. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined with my co-host this week, Jeff Kelly from Wikibon.org, the lead analyst in big data. Uh, this is theCUBE. Our flagship helps us go out to the event, talk to the smartest people we can find, even the founders of the companies that, that are making it happen. And we're here with uh, Owen O'Malley, who's the co-founder of Hortonworks, um, ex-Yahoo, big mm -hmm. data guy, Apache, foundation for many years, um, one of the main members, uh, contributors on Apache, yes. right? Exactly. Computer science degree, <laughs> master's degree, PhD. Mm -hmm. Your PhD, okay, good. Okay. Yes, I got PhD. <laughs> You're a smart guy, okay. So our job is to extract a lot of signal out of your head and share that with the audience. So, first of all, I want to ask you, first of all, congratulations on co-founding and you guys moving out. Thank you, it's and very exciting. It's been amazing. We've grown really fast over the last year and now we've announced general availability of our product and so it's, really been exciting to watch you the guys worked, over You guys worked year. hard, you came out, it's hard to get a startup start up, up and running. Granted, a lot mm -hmm. of people came over from Yahoo as part of that deal, but you know, it's hard to get mm -hmm. actual business up and running, the mechanics of operations, HR issues, you know, just get that, and just booting well, and up the structural. <laughs> a factor of three since we, we started at, at Yahoo, from spinning out of Yahoo. A so year, and in one year. In only a year. And you got your GA shipping. So let's talk about some of the science, some of the computer science, mm -hmm. we'd like to geek out a little bit. <laughs> um, it's a complicated market right now. You guys announced your intentions of working with VMware mm -hmm. on the infrastructure side, among other, IB, uh, Microsoft, among others. You know, some relation with IBM, right now at least. Um, and the same side, on the business side, the analytics is a lot of science involved. Right. That's the app side, that's where the bread is going to be buttered. Mm -hmm. um, so you got two, little, two theaters exploding. How do you guys look at that from a, from a tech perspective, science perspective? You got to run like the wind to get the tech up on the infrastructure side to enable Exactly, so we've spent a lot of time over the last six years, I've been working on Hadoop for the last six and a half years now, and um, we spent a lot of time getting the, the base platform up so that we could run things at scale, we could run things on you know huge numbers of machines, huge amounts of data, we can manage petabytes of data at a time, and now we really need to bring it to that next level where we bring the, the computation to the data analytic specialists, the people who are specialized not in doing systems programming, but instead in, in analyzing the data and extracting value out of that data. So let's talk about um, a couple different things. We'll go back to the infrastructure in a second, talk about that whole VMware thing um, and some of the tech challenges involved in, mm -hmm. in with virtualization and cloud in general challenging. Um, but on the business side, analytics is the rage. So, to those people who are the business analysts or non-PhD or non-master degree, or even CS guys, they want the data out, and this exporting is a huge issue. So how do we, how do you guys deal with that? I mean, we have an H-base table, and we gotta, we gotta get that data out. Well, again, the, the biggest win is if you can move the computation into the cluster, right? Mm -hmm. Hadoop really specializes if you can pull the data into um, or pull the computation into where the data is actually already located. So yes, exporting it's a big deal. Um, it's very easy to, um, to, to um, take down systems that aren't built to the same scale as Hadoop. All right, we've had people accidentally reference filers in their MapReduce jobs and take down the, the filer. Um, just because it can't scale to the same level. And the same with HTTP servers or any service that's not built at the same scale. So transferring data out is in fact a huge problem, as well as transferring data in. But what we see is that um, when organizations start using Hadoop as a service, they end up pulling more and more of the data in to the Hadoop cluster, and so they have less and less need to push the data out. Mm -hmm. um, they can run the computations on the cluster and, and that works the best because the, that's where all the data is and so it's much more efficient mm -hmm. than trying to pull it out piece by piece. So you run analytics, you run queries that, that pull the data down to a manageable size and then you pull that out of the cluster. So, so let's dig into that a bit more in terms of what kind of innovation are you seeing in that, mm -hmm. in that regard in terms of uh, some, of the, some of the vendors here perhaps that are working on that le uh, level, the analytics level, kind of embedding mm -hmm. that inside of Hadoop rather than, as you say, pulling the data out. Because of course, you know, agree completely, one of the big you know, tenets of big data is move data as little as possible, bring as much as the processing and compute to the data Absolutely. where it lives. 
So what are we seeing in terms of innovation there? So there's a lot of, of innovation, and that's in fact where the ecosystem is just really blowing up. So you see a lot of people in terms of the visualizations, right, mm -hmm. with the Pinto and Datamir, those guys have been working on pushing the computation into the cluster for a long time, and mm -hmm. then giving nice interfaces. So part of the thing with Microsoft, for instance, is doing exactly that, mm -hmm. right? They, they want to make an Excel front end to your results coming out of Hadoop. So you, you put your query in to your workstation um, and the user interface you're used to, and it gets sent out to the Hadoop cluster to do the computation. Mm -hmm. And then the results come back in, in the way you want to see it. Oh, and let me ask you a question. Let's take a step back in, mm -hmm. into your uh, personal life uh, for a second. <laughs> Away from the big data industry, you went to UCLA in the right. 80s. You and I are the same age. I graduated uh, same same time with my CS degree. But back then it was you know just starting to start to see network-based uh, programming. C was right around the corner. Sun, mm -hmm. Sun hit the table with Sun Tools and, the, and workstations. All great stuff, right? Um, I want you to talk about what happened between those years and now from a science perspective where you know, ontologies as a random example, or AI, and this new, that was all voodoo and kind of high-end academic stuff. What, in your mind, was once academic that's now mainstream, with the new data paradigm that's available out there? The big thing is really just how important those analytics have become to the mainstream, right? We saw a keynote today from the CTO of Sears saying how important the analytics is to Sears, right? Which was traditionally a bricks and mortar company. Um, and yet they're driving huge amounts of value out of the, the data that they've been able to process. Um, and we're seeing that across the board, right? In a wide range of industries, we've um, got customers that have huge inflows of data, and the more they're able to analyze that data and, and instead of throwing it away like they did previously, take advantage of it and monetize it, they make the company more money, and, and that's huge. Um, of course, from a discipline standpoint, from computer science, you know, Brown, you know, all these guys out there, you see all these well known with their CS department, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, going back and inventing of the internet. Um, what, there's always two types of CS programs, right? There's the academic high end, you know, that's pie in the sky, you're going to be a professor, mm -hmm. you know, that's Berkeley, basically. Um, and then reality, more practitioner. Pilot design, databases, I've seen those tracks became kind of uh, of the 80s, those days. What's happening now? What changes in the computer science curriculum that are really representative that were once far-fetched? The, well, there's a wide range of them. Um, one of the, the guys that I went to grad school with, for example, founded a uh, course in at UC Santa Cruz in how to do game design, right? So how to do video games is now a, a valid piece of study in a university setting. That's just unheard of, right, <laughs> back, back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I, everyone would have signed up for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, sign me up. Um, but we're seeing a lot of the stuff that, that was just in the AI labs and the very academic researchers, right? Machine learning for most of the 90s was all very academic, you know, use Prolog, use these technologies that weren't in the mainstream at all. And now, instead, they're they're becoming critical to all these Fortune 500 companies, right? All the Fortune 500 companies yeah. want to figure out how to use the data they have, how to do machine learning to take advantage of of their information, and and figure out how to serve their customers better. What about streaming engines? I read a tweet yesterday about streaming engines are real mm -hmm. hot right now, all the rage. You essentially, you know, activity streams with data. You have all kinds of new, uh, I guess, uh, you know. Um, Jeffrey Moore is saying machine log, logs, log data is like the new currency. Um, but we're living in a streaming market where you've got streaming data going on. It's essentially distributed computing. It's a network, right? Well, you have both scales, right? You have log processing that you do longer term, but then you need to have a feedback loop where that goes to the, um, the customer and, and changes how your site interacts with the customer. So we've... AKA real time. AK real time, <laughs> exactly. So Hadoop has always had that feedback cycle um, and it all depends on how much processing you want to do. So there are short term feedback loops, but then there are longer ones where it can take a week or more to process the logs. But 
based on those logs, you generate models that you can then apply in real time. We were talking with Jeff Jonas uh, at IBM. I don't know if you know Jeff. He's uh, one of the scientists. I haven't met there. him, but great guy. He's, <laughs> he's been an entrepreneur. He started a company in his car, as he said. Um, but we we're talking about some of those projects he's doing. He wants to get to a, um, a certain millisecond performance time. Mm -hmm. What's been great about Hadoop has been fantastic on the batch, you know, good job. Um, but it, it's near real time, right? We're talking, you know, run a hive job, come back, it's 15 minutes, have lunch. But now, with some of the stuff we're seeing with, uh, with HBase and these mm -hmm. real time, it's near real time. Where, what level of performance real time will we get to soon on, the, on Hadoop? Well, already you, already you already have millisecond response times off of HBase. Facebook, for example, does all of their messenger traffic. So anytime I send a message to someone on Facebook, that's really a row in a um, HBase table. And that's being you served out, out of HBase. So those guys have, have pushed HBase really hard. So they're millisecond performance on that. Yeah, they are getting. So we're there. Yeah, well, we're, we're Facebook's there. Facebook's there. Well, Facebook's right. there. Not now, right. granted, they've got a huge HBase team that's working on HBase, so but it'll the, take the, a while for that. That debunks the myth of, this is 15 minutes, get a cup of coffee, have lunch, and come back. Absolutely. And maybe for a MapReduce so job. For MapReduce, absolutely, it's going to take 15 minutes to run, mm -hmm. but for HBase, you can get there in, in real time, basically. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the product. So, mm -hmm. but uh, let's talk about, first of all, why a product? Why did uh, Hortonworks decide that you know, we need to, our own distribution? There was some talk when you guys emerged that mm -hmm. maybe you wouldn't go that route. Um, and how does that fit into uh, what you're doing in terms of your overall business model? The, what we were really interested in was making Apache Hadoop very easy to consume, right? We wanted to make Apache Hadoop and the projects around it, because it's not just Apache Hadoop, right? There's a whole set of projects mm -hmm. that mostly are at Apache that you need all working together to um, make the, the whole product usable. Right. And so there weren't any releases that were strictly Apache releases, and so we needed to go there because no one else was doing it. We've been responsible for every stable version of Apache Hadoop that, that's come out of Apache, mm -hmm. and so we're just continuing that trend of we're making it easier for other corporations other than Yahoo to consume. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's basically why, is because we wanted to focus on open source. We didn't want to fragment the market further by making a distro that was different from Apache. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to take the Apache uh, code, make it all work together between all the projects and make that available to users and, and make it very easy to do. One, one um, comment that Jeffrey Moore made was about uh, crossing the chasm was around um, domain expertise. We're in that mm -hmm. stage where, you know, use cases, domain expertise. We were at the HBase conference and I, we called HBase the tailored suit. You know, you get <laughs> your use case, you tailor it up, but don't try to put it on someone else, it may not fit, right? So, but it'll work great, high performance. Mm -hmm. To get to the bigger market, you got to kind of make it more general. So the question I have for you is that, um, know, having knowing your background in CS, um, Data is about semantics, right? The semantic web, Tim Berners-Lee's project. Mm -hmm. So let, let me get your, just your personal perspective on the semantic web, because that's a vision that's very search and website specific, but with the social web and the quote, social exhaust, as we would say, um, at uh, Todd from, Doc, Dr. Lucky Spin, you know, Doc, Todd from Continuity, you know, he's commenting this all the time, you have new data types, you have machine data, you got mm -hmm. people data, you got application data now funneling in all this data from the edge. Right. What's your vision around how that's going to change the semantic web and what kinds of thinking needs to get our, uh, our head around that? The important part of analyzing all that data is getting it into a consistent set of formats, right? So you need to, to get it into the systems that let you um, process it efficiently on a large number of computers because the, traditionally the semantic web processors ran on small numbers of nodes and so Pushing the scale out will let us do really exciting analysis and, and push the boundaries much further. So question around, um, we've been talking this week around data sets, obviously mm -hmm. Avro's uh, a hot project that Doug mm -hmm. Cutting's on. Um, Google has protocol buffers. What's your take on protocol buffers versus say Avro? Um, they're both very exciting. Um, we've, um, in the Hadoop project, we've started using protocol buffers for but our But one's an Apache project, one's not, right? So It is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and you can so say it, come on. <laughs> come on, you, you can be aggressive. 
It's 10 times better. <laughs> No, for different contexts, the different projects are, are, are good for different things. Um, Google runs protocol buffers directly. They, they manage it. On the other hand, it's very stable. It's very well documented. Um, you know exactly what you're going to get, but if you need to make a change, it's very unlikely to go in because Google depends on it and they control it absolutely. Um, Avro's an Apache project, so um, it's, all it's open. open to everyone. It, it's not a single person dictating what goes in. It, it's a community effort. But the effort behind is looking at more data sets, right? So it's, as a programmer. Yeah. As a programmer. Um, it's more elegant, I guess, to, from a coding, is it? That's for RPC, protocol buffers tend to work better. Um, in Hadoop, we've gone to protocol buffers for our RPC to get that version compatibility so you can get backward and forward compatibility. But for storage, um, Avro is a much tighter format, and so you move more of the metadata to the header of the file, and you can have smaller records. So it's much more efficient, and the community is much more diverse. It's not just one company, it's a wide range of companies working Owen on it. Owen O'Malley, co-founder of Hortonworks, so we're getting the hook here. Uh, final comment I'd like you to just share with the folks out there. Uh, what's it been like to be an entrepreneur, leaving Yahoo, leaving the mothership, and doing something on your own with your cohorts, and, and what, what is Hortonworks all about these days? It's really exciting. Well, first of all, we're growing very fast. As I said, we've tripled in size over the last year, which hiring in, in the Hadoop space is very <laughs> challenging. As I'm sure you've talked to, most of the people are saying, we're hiring, and it's true, right? Almost mm -hmm, every yeah. company you talk to out here on the floor is saying we're hiring. Um, and so it's just very exciting. I'm really jazzed that our release is out there, that um, we're um, being able to ship to the public uh, starting tomorrow, and so that's been a wild ride. It's been great. Product hit, hitting, the, hitting, the, hitting the market. Uh, Owen, thanks for coming into theCUBE. We appreciate it, and uh, congratulations, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>